Okay, friends and neighbors, DK here with Mr. V Amps, and I'm going to attempt to uh, deal with a subject in a manner that those of us who aren't electronics or electrical engineers can understand, and in the way that I sort of understand it, because I'm not a genius, okay? Now, this is going to be about two biasing, okay? Now, I should have some kind of really cool graphic here. There, that's cool. That's an 807 tube. That's one of the coolest looking tubes. It's actually very similar in performance to a 6L6, and we have an amplifier that runs that as its power tube in single end, and it's really freaking loud. Okay, so... What the heck is bias in the first place? Let's cover a more simple topic that people have a difficult time dealing with when it comes to amplifiers, and that's the concept that both AC and DC can exist in the same piece of wire, okay? So let's not even think about AC or DC. Let's think about my crappy little power supply there. Okay, that's a bench power supply. It's a DC power supply. It can go between 1 and 40 volts. Okay, but let's use the simplest numbers we possibly can. Okay, now, let's just say, for example, I turn my DC power supply on to 1 volt. Okay, and I were to read the output, it would be 1 volt. Okay, we got 1 volt. Now, is it possible for me to turn my power supply up to 2 volts? Sounds logical. I could turn it up to 2 volts, right? Okay. And then I could turn my power supply down to 0 volts. Okay. And then I could turn it back up to 2 volts. Okay, well, I'm going to run out of real estate, so I'd be up here, you know. I can essentially take my power supply, which has 1 volt, and I can turn it up to 2 and turn it down to 0. Logical. I could do that. That's actually what's happening in your tube amp, except the numbers are a heck of a lot higher. Okay? There's the DC voltage is sort of the median voltage that we've got running, and we could increase it or decrease it. What do we increase it or decrease it with? That's how we, when we modulate our tube, in UK English, they refer to the vacuum tubes as thermionic valves. And to think of them as valves is actually pretty smart. If this was water, and I was running one gallon per minute, I could turn the spigot up so it put out two gallons per minute, or I could turn it all the way down until it was off, and then I could turn it back up to one gallon per minute. Right? Okay, cool. Have we got that? I think we got that. That wasn't too hard. Now, let's just take another example here of what we have going on in our amp. So I'll draw it again, and I will set 100 volts as our median voltage, and I could go up to 110 or 90, plus and minus 10 volts, okay? So zero is going to be way down there, so me drawing that line there was silly. But I have 100 volts, and I'm going up to 110, and I'm going down to 90, and I'm going back to 110, and I'm going down to 90. Okay? Fair enough. Now, if I were to use a capacitor and put that in circuit with this, that 100 volts would be blocked. Okay? So what would I get out of the other side? Well, it wouldn't be this. In a perfect world, on the other side of my capacitor, let's kick the camera, that's good. I would see a signal that looked like, so if this is the zero point, I would have 
a plus 10 and a minus 10. So on the other side of my capacitor, I've got, you know, minus 10, plus 10. I've got my signal there. Okay, that's what I would get on the other side of my capacitor. It's also what I would get on the other side of a transformer, sort of, okay? When you pass things through a transformer, there are voltage and amperage ratios that change, but I would still be only getting the fluctuating signal with, that would return to zero. And why would we have a signal that returns to zero? Well, it's for the sake of a speaker. If you've ever put a battery to a speaker, what does it do? It pops forward and then burns up. Or if you put it backwards, it pops backwards and burns up because it's just trying to burn DC voltage. So our capacitor and or output transformer, which yes, this is a real tube amp output transformer. It's a very tiny one for a little amp or a radio that puts out about two or three watts. So for our speaker, we are separating the AC from the combined AC and DC that I talked about here in extremely low numbers. Are we hanging in there? Are we? I hope so. Now let's think of something completely different from electricity. This is a poorly drawn brick wall from the side view. This is a very poorly drawn, don't get dirty on me, put a hose there and we'll have a motor over here. This is a pressure washer that can spray massive amounts of water onto the wall. Okay? That's really silly, isn't it? But it's actually a good example to understand what's going on in the tube. If we equivocate the water to the electricity, we have an origin at the cathode, or actually an origin back here at our water supply, right? We have a supply back here that's supplying water, and at high pressure it is being shot towards the anode, which would be the plate of the tube, or, you know, the plate, the anode, whichever you prefer to call it, at a very high speed. And how much is being shot out of the pressure washer is a function of the trigger, okay? Right, we could good with that. And let's just say we have a trigger that's more advanced than on and off. We can squeeze it a little bit more and get slightly more or we can release a little bit and get slightly less okay now if you've ever used a pressure washer or seen anyone use a pressure washer depending on how high pressure it is it can be a very destructive force there are people digging holes with pressure washers there are people who can cut down small trees with pressure washers damage concrete with pressure washers and the same thing can happen with too much electricity in a vacuum tube. So here's a crude drawing of a vacuum tube as would be seen on a schematic. Okay, you have your water supply or electricity supply coming from your cathode. It wants to throw off a mass amount of electrons or in this case water per se. And all of that is going to be shot towards the plate or the anode. Okay? So all the pressure is going that direction. Boy, these are beautiful drawings, aren't they? Now the trigger or valve that controls how much water comes out is your grid of the tube, Here's, and this grid, the control grid, not to be mistaken with the screen grid, but that's again beyond what we're trying to cover here. This grid is just, it functions in the same way that a water valve would function. You can turn it on for more water or off for less water. 
Okay, let's just use our imagination and say this particular fictional tube is going to run at 400 volts. And I wish to use it to amplify a signal. My job is to figure out how far I need to open this valve for my one singular power tube to be able to reach its maximum threshold and minimum threshold. Because we're dealing with this DC going through here, my tube is not permitted to drop below zero. If I were to try and go below zero, the tube would stop, the water would stop flowing, and the bottom of my wave that I'm creating here would be completely cut off. Okay? There's also a threshold at the top of my wave based on the capability of the tube, and if I ex try to exceed that, that will obviously be quashed. The function of trying to bias this tube is to find the nice midpoint where I'm using the full operable range of the tube without trying to push it too far that it will damage it. Okay, now how does one determine what all of these magical, mystical numbers are? for biasing tubes and things like that. We simply have to look at the spec sheet of our tube. This is one for an 807 tube. Not exactly the RCA one, but it's gonna be almost identical. Okay, so things we care about. Maximum anode voltage, 600 volts. That's a boatload. Most of your guitar amps aren't gonna put that on anyway. They're probably gonna be more like four, 450, whatever. Gonna be hard to hurt this puppy and our maximum anode dissipation or plate dissipation is 25 watts, okay? Now, watts is volts times amps. So, one volt times one amp would be one watt. Now, we certainly wouldn't want to put one amp through this tube. That would destroy it because if we had I don't know, 400 volts and one amp, that would be 400 watts. Far, far more than this tube could take. So we're going to be in the milliwatts range if we wanted to use this as a typical Class A single valve amplifier, which is what we intend to do for our demonstration. Now, we can use a little bit of mathematics to figure this out. But all we have to do to sort of figure out what the ideal point is, is to read our specification sheet. If we were, for example, running our amplifier at 300 volts, plate volts, plate to cathode, 300 volts, it suggests that we would have 83 milliamps of current. So whether we're setting it with a cathode resistor, or by turning the grid off, we would want to bias the tube at 300 volts so it was flowing 83 milliamps. And let's just do a quick fun math problem. 300 volts times 80 milliamps, so that's going to be 0 0.083 actually, 83 milliamps, and that equals 24.9 watts. That is well within the specs of the tube and is running the tube about as hard as it was intended to run. You notice they selected 83 milli milliwatts rather than, or 83 milliamps rather than 84. You really don't want to push past the 100% threshold in class A, generally floating around 90 to 95%. They're running at about 98% here. And now it's tomorrow due to a dead battery, and I realized yesterday I said something stupid. When we were looking at the other example at 500 volts, it was 50 milliamps at 500 volts that would give us the 25 watts for plate dissipation.
This is for a Class A single-ended amplifier. Now, we also have examples for a Class AB, a push-pull type amplifier. And if we look here, we're going to see a little bit different Okay, figure. so here I am correcting myself again when I go to watch this back and edit. So um, what we have listed for our Class AB amplifier is the anode voltage is at 500 and the anode current is set to 100. Now wait a minute, when we were in class A we had 500 at 50 milliamps, so you're running the tube twice as hard? No. This is for a two valve push-pull amplifier. So we have two tubes, so essentially we're still running 50 milliamps per tube just like we were in this example. All right. So hopefully that didn't lose you. They are talking about using a uh, cathode resistor here, and they actually have some recommended resistors for the cathode. So you're looking to achieve the 25 watts if you are using a amplifier biased with, biased with a cathode resistor. Okay, so we've covered biasing a 807 tube and what the manufacturer recommends. In their description there, they actually did all of the biasing that they suggested was cathode biasing. Um, there are two different ways to bias an amplifier. You can bias it with a cathode resistor or you can bias it with the um, negative voltage applied to the grid. Okay, now I'm talking technical smack again, so let's see if we can talk about that really quickly. Here is our picture of our tube here, and if we apply a resistor here, right, we apply a resistor here, that is going to resist the amount of current that can flow up through the tube. Pretty straightforward. The value of the resistor is going to depend on how much plate voltage and what type of tube you have. The second option, which we see any of these amplifiers that have adjustable biases, and we have that little pot to turn and we're looking at our little meters and things, and um, what we are doing is we're applying a negative voltage to the grid to turn the tube off. And this is probably gonna be somewhere between negative 30 and negative 50 volts is typical. But again, it's going to depend completely on the types of tubes that you have. The way one biases the tube is going to vary on the circuit type that you have. A or AB, it doesn't matter. If you are using a cathode bias method, um, you are permitted to go up to the rating of your tube. In the case of the 807, it was 25 watts. In the case of a 6V6, which I have selected here, it's 12 watts. So with cathode bias, you are allowed to allow enough milliamps to get you up to 12 watts. With a Class AB amp with a fixed bias where you would be setting a voltage on the grid, they would recommend that you go to a maximum of 70% of the 12 watts. Okay, so 70% of 12. Grab your calculator here. My, my brain doesn't do math automatically quickly, sorry. And then if you are working in a Class A amplifier with a fixed bias, which I can't think of a guitar amp that does. Almost all of the Class A amplifiers I come across are cathode biased but in that case they recommend a maximum of 90 percent. Okay, So that's all we're really doing is we're just trying to figure out how far we turn the tube on before we put it at risk of damage. If we don't turn it on enough we don't get the maximum potential. We don't get as much loudness, we don't get the clarity and the sound. But it's safer for the tube if we don't turn it all the way up on the bias as far as it goes. So if I've got this 807 and I decide to run it at uh, 24 watts plate dissipation or 23 watts or 22, 
The difference is probably going to be negligible, but I'm still not quite reaching the potential of the two. Now, if I decide to do something silly and set the bias so low that, you know, we're only flowing 10 watts of power, uh, the amp is probably going to sound like crap. Or, potentially, we could say it sounds brown, like a brown out. Okay. We cool on that? Do we understand what bias is? Dear God, I hope so, because I'm having trouble explaining this and not losing my mind. So let's just leave with an outro listening to an amplifier that uses an 807 tone. <laughs>